This is a story in two parts. I first tell the story of Rembrandt's life and how the British gradually fell in love with his work, how he went from, uh, in Britain, a virtual unknown to one of the most sought after artists in the country. In the second part, I uh, show how artists copied or were influenced by his work from the 18th century up to the present day. This is Rembrandt Hammanzoon van Rijn. He spent his life in the Dutch Republic, but he became known throughout Europe in his lifetime. His reputation in Britain, however, was poorly recorded. We know that King Charles I collected Peter Paul Rubens and Anthony van Dyck, but he doesn't seem to have taken much notice of Rembrandt, although by chance he became the first collector to own Rembrandt outside the Dutch Republic. This painting, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, is one of three in the Royal Collection, which was um, inventoried between 1637 and 1639. But we know that it was given to the King by Robert Kerr, who visited the Netherlands in 1629. Rembrandt was born in Leiden in 1606. He was the ninth child of a wealthy miller, and when he was just 14, he enrolled at the University of Leiden. And as he was um, inclined towards and skilled in drawing and painting, he was apprenticed to an artist called Swanenburg. In 1624, when he was just 18, he started his own workshop. He started to accept students. And um, in 1629, he was discovered by the statesman Constantine Huygens, who obtained important commissions for him, and that resulted two years later in him moving to Amsterdam, where he became a successful portrait painter. This masterpiece was painted when Rembrandt was just 21. It looks like the work of a mature artist. This painting was one of the, together with the previous painting that we just saw, was um, they were two of the three that were presented to Charles I by Sir Robert Kerr. And um, that's when they entered the, the Royal Collection and they're, they're still in the Royal Collection today. Rembrandt was a known name in Britain, but his work could be purchased fairly cheaply compared with the great Italian Renaissance artists who were in high demand. This painting was painted towards the end of Rembrandt's time in Leiden, and it was just before he moved to Amsterdam. Note how he controls the detail of the painting, the taut mouth, the prominent nose, the sunken eyes. The figure is wearing a deep purple hood with fur mantle over a dark dress, and the control of light as it falls across the face, is masterly. Now, Rembrandt often used his mother, Nielchen, Willem's doctor, van Zoetbroek, as a model, particularly at the beginning of his career. But although this is called, often called, the artist's mother, it uh, falls into a category of painting, which was a, a type of, study, often bust or half-length, known as a trony, which is a generic term for face. Now these tronies were intended to demonstrate the skill of an artist and establish their reputation, and as such they move beyond the mere realistic imitation of old age to become exercises in imagination, and often incorporated unusual costumes and vivid lighting effects, and they became much sought after by collectors. This is another of Rembrandt's early masterpieces. It's Rembrandt's fame in England in the 17th century rested on his etchings. The diarist uh, John Evelyn mentions the incomparable Rembrandt and Samuel Pepys in 1700 had a large collection of etchings which included eight Rembrandts, although it does seem as though Pepys was unaware of the name of the artist. 
another collector, Hans Sloan, whose collection became the cornerstone of the British Museum in 1753, owned a number of Rembrandt's prints which came from uh, a large collection by William Corton, which was um, included uh, the entire oeuvre of Rembrandt prints. Although his reputation was established through his etchings, there were a few works by Rembrandt that entered Britain in the 17th century. Those are two portraits of a British couple that were painted by Rembrandt in 1634 and they brought those back to Norfolk. There, were a, there was a collection of paintings in the mid 17th century that included one Rembrandt that was imported to Edinburgh. Another one was um, purchased for £20 and is still at Kingston Lacey in Dorset but although it's now known to be a copy. And there are four drawings that were thought at the time to be by Rembrandt of the English countryside, but as he never visited England, um, it, they're, they're not um, now thought to be by Rembrandt. This particular image, the three crosses, shows Christ with the, the two thieves either side of him, the good thief on the right, illuminated by a beam of light from heaven. We see two on the left of Christ, the centurion who's just dismounted from his horse. And um, this is the centurion who in the Bible uh, says certainly this was a righteous man. It's um, dry point is a, um, a form of etching where the artist uses a uh, like um, a pencil or a pen but uh, with a needle point that scratches into what at the time was a, a copper plate creating a very delicate line that's easily worn down by the pressure of the printing press and in this case Rembrandt has reworked the plate re-scored the plate using the needle and this has um, altered and extended the image the other thing about it is that it's the only work um, of this impression that's printed on vellum, which is calfskin. And although it doesn't absorb the ink as well as paper, this creates um, a, a, a subtle blurred effect that adds to the atmosphere and the drama of the scene. This is Belshazzar's Feast. Uh, let me this is the company of Franz Banningcock and William de Reutenberg, known um, more often as the Night Watch. It's um, one of the most famous of Rembrandt's paintings. In fact, it's one of the most famous paintings of the Dutch Golden Age. It's a very large painting. It's um, some four and a half metres wide. It uses dramatic light and shade, uh, but more than that, it's transformed by Rembrandt from what was conventionally just a, a static group of people, a common convention for group portraits of this type, into a dynamic scene of action. The company is moving out. It's led by Captain Cock. His lieutenant is on his right, and our eyes flow round all the activities and actions of the painting from the uh, standard bearer at the back left to the high-lit woman carrying a dead chicken around her waist. You might wonder why there's a woman carrying a dead chicken, but it's, it's uh, thought that claws, had the claws of the dead chicken, which is clauven in Dutch, is a reference to clauveneers or arquebusiers, the um, infantrymen in the company. And the dead chicken also represents the defeated enemy and the yellow of the woman's dress signifies victory. So just a few um, examples of the symbolism that's hidden in this painting. It used to be very hidden because it was um, the painting was covered in dark varnish which gave rise to its informal name, the Night Watch. But now that it's been cleaned, the glory of the painting has um, come out. 
It um, has got a mixed um, history in terms of um, its uh, reception in that uh, in 1911 a shoemaker slashed it in protest because he couldn't find work but luckily the thick varnish of the painting protected. In 1939 it was rolled up and stored in a cave for the duration of the war. In 1975 a school teacher attacked it with a bread knife believing he'd been ordered to do it by God. He, he committed suicide the following year. The painting took four years to restore and some of the damage he did is still visible. Then in 1990, an escaped psychiatric patient sprayed it with acid, but luckily the guards quickly sprayed water on the painting and it was, the painting was protected by the thick varnish. Another um, restoration is underway. It's just started in 2019 and the painting is now behind a special glass enclosure so that um, visitors to the Rijksmuseum can see the restoration as it progresses. In fact, anyone in the world can see it as it's being live streamed and there's various videos available discussing the work and the findings as the work progresses. It's known if you search as Operation Night Watch. In 1641, Rembrandt had a son, Titus, who lived to adulthood. In 1642, his wife Saskia died of tuberculosis and he hired Hircher Dierks as a, um, a nurse and caretaker for Titus and she became Rembrandt's lover later. She charged Rembrandt with breach of promise and was awarded 200 guilders a year. In, 16, in the 1640s Rembrandt began a relationship with the much younger Henrika Stoffels who had been his maid and they had a daughter Cornelia and um, the reason they didn't marry is that Saskia had left a will which meant that if Rembrandt remarried he had to pay Titus all the money that she had left him in her will. This work, A Woman in Bed, Sarah, was acquired by a British collector in 1776. It's thought to be a biblical scene portraying Sarah, wife of Tobias, who is willing him on to kill a demon that had killed her seven previous husbands on their wedding nights. By this time, well, by the 1750s, Rembrandt mania was in full swing, particularly regarding his etchings. The... Um, they were uh, well suited to the what was popular at the time and he became Rembrandt became so popular that uh, he was subject to satire and there was a large market in uh, fake Rembrandts copies of Rembrandt and works that were in the style of Rembrandt William Hogarth criticized his work he said, designed and etched in the ridiculous manner of Rembrandt. Hogarth was always trying to promote British artists, whereas collectors seemed to prefer Italian, French and Dutch artists. There was one um, play that uh, was about the corrupt art market and in it an auctioneer tries to sell a forged Rembrandt for 10 guineas at the time, five guineas was an enormous price for a print. And Horace Walpole comments on the madness to have a Rembrandt print, which he describes as scratches that sell for 30 guineas. But by 1770, it was observed that a genuine work of this master are rarely to be met with, and whenever they are to be purchased, they afford incredible prices and because of those high prices as I said there were a lot of fakes but also um, works in the style of let me give you an example 
the it was believed at the time that um, Rembrandt's the women in Rembrandt's work were um, too too ugly, and there a lot of the copies the face has been made prettier. Let me give you an example. This is a mezzotint by William Dickinson after a painting by Matthew William Peters, later Reverend Matthew William Peters. And, well, I'll say no more. I'll uh, let you judge which is the greater work. This is Girl at a Window, painted when Rembrandt was 39. And it's um, not a, not a portrait, but it's it's somewhere between a genre painting and a portrait. We don't know who the girl is. Uh, she has, at some stage in the past, been described as a courtesan, a Jewish bride, and historical or biblical figure. But it's now believed that it's a a picture of a servant girl, uh, the tanned face and arms imply she works outside. She's staring directly out at us while she fiddles with her necklace, a gold chain or cord. It, um, it, the work was um, owned by French art theorist Roger de Piles, who claimed that Rembrandt put this picture in his window and passers-by mistook it for a real girl. It, it's not believed that this story was strictly true, but it does um, serve as a general comment about Rembrandt's ability to paint realistic portraits that could seduce the eye. These um, trompe l'oeil paintings where the subject seems to protrude out of the picture frame became popular in the 17th century and Rembrandt continued to use and ad adopt this pose in uh, his later works. In his um, life, by 1656, he narrowly avoided bankruptcy through a court arrangement. He had to sell his large art collection. In fact, it was the purchase of the art collection that had caused many of his financial problems. But when he sold it, he didn't get back the money that he'd hoped to. So he had to sell his house and his printing press. The Artist Guild then introduced a new rule that prevented an artist in his position from trading. So Hendrika and Titus set up a company and employed him so that technically speaking he wasn't um, taking on commissions in his own name. He was merely an employee. But he was still um, well known. He, for example, when Cosimo de Medici came to Amsterdam, um, he visited Rembrandt. In 1663, he, um, di uh, Hendrika died. In 1668, Titus died, leaving a baby daughter. And Rembrandt died in 1669 and was buried as a poor man. By the 1780s, the interest in mezzotints of Rembrandt's pictures had peaked and artists were influenced by his work. In, in fact, the artist John Opie was known as the English Rembrandt. Another um, famous artist, in fact, president of the Royal Academy, Joshua Reynolds, uh, collected Rembrandt, although um, in his lectures that he gave, he didn't refer to Rembrandt's work that often and when he did it was often as an example to avoid and it, interestingly when he visited the Netherlands he saw the night watch and described it as the worst of him I ever saw. By the end of the 18th century the market was flooded with fake Rembrandts but it was also the time of the French Revolution and major works of Rembrandt were being bought by British collectors and George IV became the first British monarch to actively collect works by Rembrandt and he bought this work, the shipbuilder and his wife, Jan Rickson and his wife Griet Jans. He also bought the mill which we'll see later 
uh, one of the self-portraits and Titus at his desk. The, um, the two people in the painting weren't identified until the 1970s, but we now know he was a master shipbuilder of the Dutch East India Company. This is Susanna and the Elders, which Rembrandt painted in 1647. I thought I'd start with just a brief summary, just a reminder of the story of Susanna from uh, the book of Daniel. There was a rich man called Joachim who married a very beautiful woman called Susanna. Two judges frequently held um, their cases at Joachim's house and lusted after his wife. Now, she frequently walked in her garden and one day they returned and hid in the garden. She decided to bathe and asked her two maids to fetch some oil and lock the garden gate. When they had gone, the two elders came out of hiding and threatened her that if she didn't have sex with them, they would tell everyone that they'd seen her having sex with a young man and she would be executed. She refused to comply. The next day a trial was held and she was found guilty based on their false testimony. But a young man called Daniel, guided by God, saw she was innocent and called for a retrial, which was agreed. He separated the two judges and questioned them and they each gave a different account of the previous day. They were found guilty and executed and Susanna was seen to be innocent. So this scene, Susanna and the Elders, is often um, shown by, represented by artists and some artists show her as more compliant than others. Uh, some show her completely naked. Rembrandt here shows her partly draped, turning away from them and looking at us for help. I've got an enlargement of the face so that you can see the look on the face. I think it's one of um, fear, desperation, as she's looking out at us. Interestingly, the um, painting has been x-rayed in 2015 and it shows that the painting underwent extensive alterations at some time and the pigments used didn't exist till the 17th century and some parts are not in the style of Rembrandt. So it's now believed that it was painted over in the 18th century and we believe the culprit is or was Joshua Reynolds, president of the Royal Academy, who, as I said, collected Rembrandts. And we know that he frequently altered paintings that he owned. And let me just show you the areas marked with the red outline are those areas that are original Rembrandt and the other areas were scrubbed out using solvents and repainted by Joshua Reynolds. We, we got no idea of his motivation. He obviously thought um, he was improving the painting. By the 19th century, major collectors were collecting Rembrandt. Um, attitudes changed the need to follow academic traditions became less important and the strict rules were relaxed. And with that new way of seeing the world, Rembrandt became universally accepted as a genius. His subject matter and technique, which was previously seen to not follow the strict rules that were used by the other old masters, were now seen to be examples of his, quotes, gigantic but barbarous genius. William Hazlitt, for example, claimed, if ever there was a man of genius, he was one. Not everyone agreed with this, but at this time, the early 19th century, the Romantic period, was a time when a, a solitary artistic genius was idealised and Rembrandt was a perfect example of the heroic genius. So his life was often dramatised and his work related to his personal circumstances rather than the social and cultural circumstances of the period. The Mill, this painting, 
is one of those paintings that are significant, not only because it's a beautiful painting in its own right, but because it has profoundly influenced the history of taste. It was regarded by 18th and 19th century collectors as um, one of his greatest works. And during the Romantic era, the um, dramatic silhouette of the mill seen against the stormy sky captured their imagination and many stories and myths circulated about the painting. Uh, some thought it was a picture of Rembrandt's father's mill. Others saw it as a foreshadowing of Rembrandt's severe financial difficulties of the mid-1650s with its, because of its dark, threatening sky. This is um, Christ and the woman taking an adultery. Uh, the story is from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 8. This is where the Pharisees, attempting to outwit and fool Christ, asking if the woman should be stoned to death according to the law. And Christ replies, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. The audience was confounded and the woman was freed, and Christ's parting remark was, Go and sin no more. The um, I have an enlargement of the painting, of the centre of the painting, so you can see more detail about um, the woman and Christ. This painting is of interest because it was in John Julius's Angustine's collection of 38 paintings, which were the found acquired by the government and formed the foundation of the National Gallery in 1824. The Angustine collection included two Rembrandts, and this was one of them. And during the 19th century, the National Gallery acquired another 13, so that it now has a large collection of Rembrandts. It has 26 works. This is perhaps... Rembrandt's most famous etching, Christ Preaching. It's also known as the Hundred Gilda Print because it's alleged that um, that very large sum of money was once paid for an example of this print. It's also called Christ Healing the Sick, Christ with the Sick Around Him, Receiving Little Children, or Christ Preaching. Uh, the events are depicted and described in Matthew 19 and the story includes the um, a rich young man coming to Christ saying that um, he'd followed all the commandments and what else did he have to do? And Jesus said to him, he must sell all of his possessions and give the money to the poor and we can see the young man leaving exit stage right christ said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven he rembrandt worked on the hundred gilder print in stages through the 1640s and it was probably the critical work, the most critical work in the middle of his career and for which his fine etching style emerged. He probably completed it in 1649 and it's a incorporates an enormous diversity of techniques, dry point and burin combined. The burin is a um, like a gouging instrument used to cut into the copper plate and as I said before, the um, dry point is like a needle for finer cutting. And if you look on the, the left, you can see an example of these um, uh, of the figures produced using um, dry point with lightly bitten lines in contrast to the black richness of the print on the right hand side. Rembrandt at the time was experimenting with newly discovered mezzotint techniques. I'd like to complete the summary of Rembrandt's history. That completes the first part 
on Rembrandt's life and his influence on British collectors, connoisseurs and critics. And in this uh, second and final section, I'll cover his influence on British artists. By the 1750s, London had become a centre for Rembrandt's prints. And this is an example of a direct imitation of the style and composition of one of his most well-known portraits. Uh, Rembrandt's portrait is of his patron, Jan Six. And amongst the several imitations of this work, the most striking was this portrait of Sir Edward Astley, who was a print collector by the well-known portraitist Thomas Warledge. Wallage was um, a well-known artist at the time. He was born in Peterborough, but lived and worked most of his life in London near Covent Garden. And this portrait is regarded as one of his best pieces. Later in life, he became a drinker, obese, and suffered from gout. And he moved later to a country house in Hammersmith, and he's buried in Hammersmith Church. It is said that he had 32 children by his three marriages, but only one child, a son, survived him. Rembrandt painted this trony in the late 1650s, and such paintings were not portraits, and so the individual sitter is not that important. We don't know who it is. They were painted more as a demonstration of the artist's skill. This painting which is now called a bearded man in a cap, used to be called a Jewish rabbi, probably because of his square cut beard and the unusual hat, but the title wasn't given till the 19th century and there's no evidence that he was a rabbi. And in fact, he, the sitter does appear in other Rembrandt paintings. The hat was um, probably a studio prop. The um, painting by Rembrandt belonged to the Dukes of Argyle in the 18th century. In 1767, Gainsborough painted a famous full length of the fourth Duke of Argyle, and presumably this enabled him to study Rembrandt's painting and produce this excellent and very faithful copy, probably around 1767 to 70. There are um, differences. The Rembrandt has a contemplative, sad, introverted expression. In the Gainsborough, it's more alert, less sad in appearance. It's unusual in that um, for a, an unacademic artist like Gainsborough to copy the old masters, but um, Gainsborough did um, enjoy copying the old masters and copied Titian, Rubens, and Van Dyck, as well as this work by Rembrandt. The painting uh, remained, but by Gainsborough, remained in his possession at his death and was possibly then acquired by Queen Charlotte because it's now in the Royal Collection. This is Rembrandt's The Mill, a painting that we've seen previously. In 1806, the British institution opened its doors to artists to enable them to copy old masters that had been borrowed for the purpose. And one of the paintings that gathered the most interest was this one, Rembrandt's The Mill, and it was copied by a number of artists, including the then president of the Royal Academy, Benjamin West, uh, as well as John Constable. Why did they want to copy Rembrandt? Well, Constable delivered a series of lectures at the Royal Institution called the History of Landscape Painting, where he praised the mill, saying, it is the first picture in which a sentiment has been expressed by chiaroscuro alone, by the use, that is, of um, dark and light, in particular the dark mill against the bright sky, but with the lowering clouds above. The... Um, situation in the 18th century regarding views of Rembrandt with respect to art theory 
was that prior to the opening of the Royal Academy in 1768, the um, theory was based largely, not exclusively, but largely on French texts, and they barely mentioned Rembrandt, and if they did, they tended to praise his use of colour, but criticise his drawing. However, in the, at this time, British studios uh, copied Rembrandt extensively. I mean, copying old masters was viewed as an essential part of student training in both Britain and France. Britain lacked an academy, uh, but copying in Britain was an essential exercise in training young students and copying Rembrandt became popular by the 1740s. One prodigious collector and painter was Jonathan Richardson, who may have influenced this trend through his essay on the theory of painting, where he particularly recommends copying Rembrandt for his invention, expression and composition. And it was his collection of Rembrandt prints which was purchased by Thomas Hudson. And it was Hudson who was the teacher of jo Joshua Reynolds, who later founded and became the first president of the Royal Academy. Here I'm showing Rembrandt's The Windmill alongside James Abbott McNeil Whistler's The Unsafe Tenement. Now, Whistler was one of the great printmakers who could be put alongside Dürer and Rembrandt. And later, his Venice set, produced in the 1880s, are regarded as some of the greatest etchings of Impressionism. In 1857, in Manchester, there was a major exhibition called Art Treasures, described as the largest and most spectacular art exhibition ever mounted in Britain. There, as well as the thousands of paintings, there were over 1,800 prints, and these included 73 works by Rembrandt, who was becoming increasingly appreciated through his economy of style. Etchers distinguished themselves by their intellectual activity and power of selection over the what was regarded as the mechanical labouring required to produce a reproductive engraving. That is um, an engraving that is a copy of an existing work, painting or engraving. Visitors came from all over Europe to visit this exhibition and we know that um, Whistler travelled from Paris and it could be that this um, paint, this engraving, The Unsafe Tenement, let me show you an enlargement, is um, as a result or his response to what he saw at the exhibition. He produced 12 etchings the following year, which are now known as the French set, and this is now regarded as the first British revival of etchings. And the French set includes three landscapes, of which this is one. At its peak, the revival, the British etching revival, placed Whistler above Rembrandt. The 1890s were described by one artist. William Alpen was a friend of Augustus John. They were fellow students at the Slade. And he also fell under the spell of Rembrandt and he painted this work, ironically entitled The English Nude. It's a wonderfully realistic portrait of his mistress, whose pose is based on that of Rembrandt's Bathsheba, as we see here. Uh, Rembrandt's was also modelled on his mistress, Henry, on a mistress, Henry Stoffels. Now, Orpen had been engaged to the model, whose name was Emily Scoble, and he never exhibited or sold this painting of her. She was um, 
at the time a professional model at the Slade, and she also modelled for two other of um, Alpen's works. Like Rembrandt, Alpen has replaced the idealised Venus figure with an intimate depiction of a real person in a private domestic setting, but unlike Rembrandt, he has not placed the figure in an allegorical setting. Alpen, or Alpen's biographer, described the encounter with Rembrandt as climactic and that he instilled in him that sense of life, of people, of human drama and human feelings. The story of Bathsheba is told in the second book of Samuel. One evening, while walking along a roof of his palace, King David saw Bathsheba bathing and became infatuated. His, uh, her husband was away in the army and King David commanded her to attend him at his palace, the result of which she became pregnant. The painting here is Bathsheba preparing to um, make herself ready to visit King David and you can see she's holding a letter from the king commanding her presence. After she had visited the king, he then arranged for a husband to be sent to the heaviest fighting where he was killed. David later married Bathsheba and he was punished by God for his adultery and murder. And the painting shows the point at which she has just read the letter and is expressing her feelings of possibly regret, submission and anticipation. Uh, this painting on the right by Henrik Gottlieb, Rembrandt in Heaven, was painted when Gottlieb thought he might be dying, although the diagnosis turned out to be wrong and he lived till 1966. His wife explained, Henrik always liked to joke and he liked to say that he was going to die and wanted to pay homage to Rembrandt before doing so. He always said it with a twinkle in his eye and perhaps he was explaining or excusing the apparent strangeness of the picture. He sometimes called the picture homage to Rembrandt. And she added that he used to talk about the painters he most admired, Rembrandt, Titian, El Greco, Vermeer, Giotto, Piero della Francesca and Cezanne. And she remembered how moved he was when he described Rembrandt's painting Saul and David shown on the left, how Saul wipes away a tear from his eye with the corner of a curtain. In the swinging 60s, Rembrandt's work started to look old-fashioned, too, too earnest for the time. For many of the new breed of pop artist, he was an irrelevant museum piece. However, in London, abstraction and later conceptual art, didn't rule supreme. There was a group of figurative artists who became known as the School of London. They were Francis Bacon, Lucian Freud, Leon Kossoff and Frank Auerbach. And for them, Rembrandt was one of the undisputed giants. Now, although Lucian Freud never copied Rembrandt, Kossoff and Auerbach um, copied his work frequently uh, over the decades. Kossoff, who's shown here, Rembrandt, a woman bathing in a stream, visited the National Gallery when he was just nine years old and was moved by this painting. He said later, I don't know what struck me about it because none of the other paintings in the National Gallery where I saw it interested me at all. But somehow that painting opened up a whole new world to me. Not a world of painting so much as a way of feeling about life that I hadn't experienced before. And he added, My attitude to these works has always been to teach myself to draw from them and by repeated visits to try to understand why certain pictures have a transforming effect on my mind. 
Leon Kossoff and Frank Auerbach were lifelong friends and they were both fanatical visitors to the National Gallery. They went so often they were granted out-of-hours access so they could copy the works in peace. Auerbach copied works by Franz Howells, Titian, Caravaggio, Georges Seurat, but above all by Rembrandt. He went every day for a long period and copied the works until he could draw them as if they were his own. He defined Rembrandt's greatness as the absolute grandeur of the absolute ordinary. Perhaps his most famous variation is this one here, Study After Deposition by Rembrandt II. The work is much smaller than the Rembrandt, which isn't clear here, it's some six times smaller. Uh, he first painted a much closer version to the Rembrandt and then he abstracted from that to produce this version. So this version is a copy of a copy and um, it intentionally takes on the appearance of a London building site, which he was also painting at the time. Albach said, when I was young, I felt like I was in the ring with them, the old masters, that is. Now I just need their help. Unless you try and do something in the shadow of these great people, then it's all pointless. And in 2014, he was given the ultimate accolade of his work being hung alongside Rembrandt in the Rijksmuseum, the first living artist to receive such an honour. Glenn Brown has painted, drawn and etched variations after Rembrandt since 1996, and this is one of his earliest variants. It's based on a trony which um, was believed until recently to be by Rembrandt himself, but it's now thought to have been painted by one of his students, probably Govert Flink, uh, and he's believed to have painted it when he was working in uh, Amsterdam in about 1636. Their painting does include a false Rembrandt signature and date, 1633. Glenn Brown was born in Northumberland and is known for his appropriation of the works of other artists. He paints works based on Velasquez, Van Dyck, Rembrandt, Fragonard, Delacroix, Courbet, Renoir, Van Gogh, uh, Dali, etc. He usually starts with a reproduction and he transforms the image by changing its colour, position, orientation, height and re internal relationships and he's had numerous solo exhibitions around the world. He was nominated for the Turner Prize in 2000 but there was some controversy at the time over accusations of plagiarism as one of his works was uh, closely based on a recent science fiction illustration. The case was uh, settled later. Jenny Savile is one of the few artists of her generation who's looked at and been influenced by works of Titian, Velasquez, Rubens and Rembrandt, uh, often taken with a hint of irony. She says how important it was, how influential it was for her as a teenager when her uncle took her to the Netherlands to study the work of Rembrandt. So I've included and I would like to end with this short talk by Savile, which was produced in 2019, where she talks about how she was inspired by Rembrandt's two self-portrait with two circles that we saw earlier. The vocabulary of painting is all in this picture. I've learned how to paint a nose from this picture, how to do reflected light, the use of impasto, the use of contradiction within pictures, of having very limited movement of brush mark making with lots of brush mark making, how that creates a kind of poetic in paint. For this picture, I took all the, the kind of movement and the abstraction, the way that he used uh, the other end of the brush to draw into the paint. Often, people start figuratively and then end up being more abstract. And I found that when you get to a certain point in figuration, you've painted so much, you're almost afraid to go to abstract. So I started the process the other way around to force my hand. 
the whole picture was made from this abstract area of paint. It looks like nothing, but that was so hard to make that, to hold on to that, because that should be really like this area here, because the sun's hitting here. What Rembrandt's really good at is he turns the key. There are little points of volume all over the picture, so he's got this white cap, and the way that the shadow goes here on the forehead of the white cap, he blends the white of the light hitting the forehead with the cap, and the, these two tones hit together. And it's a way of him going, right, I'll turn the volume up here, here, here. And I've learned that, that you have these quiet moments in the painting, and then on certain moments you turn up the volume. And so that's, that's one of those moments. And it's been the most incredible learning experience. I literally worked with Rembrandt close-ups all around me. I ate my lunch looking at the picture, looking at Rembrandt. It makes you raise your bar. It's like um, deconstructing a great piece of Beethoven or something like that. It's on that level. Rembrandt is like a Beethoven, a Shakespeare. I mean, he's, he's that level of humanity, who, of, of someone who can turn that screw inside you. You can see so much modern painting. The whole picture, if you divide it up, you know, there's a Rothko here, there's a Rothko here. Think about Bacon uses a limited ground with impasto paint. I mean, that comes directly out of Velasquez and Rembrandt. What this show really exhibits is how many artists have looked at Rembrandt and taken different things from him. The dexterity of, of imagination and human thinking and ways to look at the world and themselves is just, you know, it's all here, isn't it? And, and Rembrandt becomes this pinnacle. You know, you, you can take any of these pictures and see Rembrandt. If I was Rembrandt in 350 years and a lot of artists are doing work about my work, I'd be so happy. So it makes him a young kid on the block the marriage, the, the, the mirroring of all the pictures here is just inspiring, isn't it?